Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today we're sitting down with a man I am, I, I could not be more excited to be talking to. My, truly, uh, you can, I, I've, I've said this on a show before, one of my all-time heroes, the person who's inspired my <laughs> personal painting more than anybody else, uh, uh, someone who I'm constantly trying to emulate in all the best ways, I hope. Uh, it's Richard Gray. How you doing, sir? Uh, not bad, thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great to have you on the show. Wonderful to sit down with you and talk. Obviously, Richard has won uh, a host of awards in painting over the year, Golden Demons galore, as well as many other competitions. Uh, you are well known as a master of, of many different things. I would argue that uh, probably what many people know you for is the stunning freehand that you often incorporate into your models, the artistic flourishes and embellishments. We're going to look at some of those later on. Uh, but uh, hey, it's, it's great to have you along. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're going to talk about lots of things today. We're going to talk a little about Golden Demon. We're going to talk a little about uh, sort of your career in competition and judging. And I want to talk about Cult of Paint as well, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and But of course, uh, it, as we're going to begin, it's important with all of this to uh, to begin at the beginning. All right. So the, we're gonna, we're gonna, it's, it's, a, it's a standard question, but I think it's a good one. How did you come to miniature painting like what was the what was the inflection point in your life because we're all weird right we yeah. all decided as adults we all still decide every day to sit down and put paint on tiny plastic people this is not a normal thing that most people do in their lives so how did you decide for the first time this is what i'm going to do i'm going to put some some paint on a brush and put it on a tiny plastic or metal person um well i think my uh, starting point is fairly common i started with um hero quest and space crusade um, and if you uh, ever played those games uh, and you looked on the side of the boxes that had like the, the painted models on there, mm -hmm. uh, I just thought they looked really cool. Um, I wanted to try and emulate that. Uh, I, I came across a, a white dwarf around a similar sort of time, um, which obviously had some uh, amazing painted models in. Um, that really hooked me. Uh, and so I immediately went and got some uh, completely inappropriate paints and a terrible paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like enamel paints. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, and it was, uh, you know, a, a terrible mess. <laughs> but uh, but it hooked you all the like, same. Yeah. It. Hooked, I mean, it was. It was just. It was just fun. Like, I don't, I, I've always been into art. Um, you know from a very young age, I've always been drawing and painting things uh, like sci-fi and fantasy. Um, so I found like it was just like a natural kind of progression to uh, to paint the, the cool sci-fi and fantasy models. <laughs> nice. So you were into art. So there, that's a, that's a good place I want to drill in on because I'm always fascinated by people who were into art and then get into the hobby. So this is a, this, and I'm, I'm jealous of it. Because, you know, I I don't have an artistic background. Like, I like to draw as a kid. I read comics, and I would try to draw some people that were in the comics every so often poorly, as many <laughs> of us did. Uh, but, I, you know, my my formal art training, let's say, is highly lacking. So did you do any formal training? Were you just into it yourself? Like, did you take art classes in school beyond just sort of the required one where we all sat around and, <laughs> you know, messed with some watercolors or something? Uh, like, um, how much was that a part of your life? Um, it was a big part of my life, actually. Uh, originally, I wanted to do kind of like book covers and things because I was into Games Workshop so early. Um, I loved the the covers on codexes and uh, all those kind of things, uh, and just fancy book covers in general. Um, I was always like, art was always my my best lesson at school. Um, you know, I was getting prizes and things in the class, uh, and that kind of like just encouraged me to, to try more. Sure. Um, and then I took a degree in visual communication, specializing in illustration. Um, and I think that probably is an element of where the freehand comes in a little bit. Um, I mean, people are always like, oh, so you're an illustrator, that's why you do freehand. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tra translate that well because the scale is right. so different. <laughs> um, but certain um, you know elements do work, are important, like if you want to, um, create realistic images and like just depth and lighting and stuff. But also the illustration work uh, is really handy in just painting models as well, you know, for creating the, the lighting 
uh, and light placement and things like that. Well, and so, you know, another thing that you're very known for is some really, really eye-catching non-metallic metal, some, a, a technique, a style, a whatever you want to call it, a, a, a method of painting that I think confounds a lot of people and a lot of people find challenging. Did your 2D, you know, kind of background, because obviously that's where that comes from, right? The, the sort of non-metallic yeah, yeah. metal evolves out of two-dimensional illustration. My understanding mm -hmm. of it is going back to, I guess, Chinese art and stuff like that is some of the first places that it was it was seen and then it moved its way yeah. west and stuff like that. You see it a lot in obviously the old masters paintings and things like that. Yeah, so definitely. do you feel like that influenced it? Because you were comfortable with those colors and in creating these lighting effects on a two-dimensional canvas, it was just natural for you to bring it over. Uh, yeah, uh, very much that. Um, also, it's, it's kind of strange because uh, everyone calls it non-metallic metal and things like that. Um, but in two-dimensional painting, it's just metal. <laughs> yeah, <know>? sure. <laughs> um, it's very much a, a miniature-focused thing for calling it uh, non-metallics, um, which is just always something interesting because there's always this debate about true metals versus non-metals and things like that. But because of my background in 2D painting, um, like I actually I'm not that keen on painting true metals. Um, and because like if you were trying to replicate anything else, so you're painting leather or ceramics or any kind of material, you know, you paint it exactly the same way as painting a metallic effect. Right. Uh, and it's, it's only in model painting that this true metals um, discussion comes up and like that you have to replicate metals in a completely different way. Yeah, it's it is interesting that we like we have these, uh, you know, often aluminum powder, or mica powder paints that, that reflect like that. And so it becomes just the way to do it. Uh, oftentimes, like when, when many of us start, it's simply like, oh, well, I want to paint metal. This paint says metal on the, on the, on the pot. Right. So that's what yeah. I'll use. Uh, that, that's sort of the way we all, we all, you know, started. You used, this one says flesh tone. Okay. It must be flesh. Like, this is what I will use. For, A is for B. Got it. Check. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I imagine so that, but that's a sort of an interesting rabbit hole I want to go down as well. Uh, your flesh tones are often really colorful and vibrant, and that's another place where two dimensional art often will vary wildly from how we think about miniature painting. Maybe not mm -hmm. in the same way, but I find that like when exploring flesh on when you look at flesh in, in uh, traditional painting, it in it in just every color in the rainbow will often work its way in there, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, yet, yet we tend to be very neutral. So do you find that to be the same sort of thing where you just, you know, go nuts, you can work in any color and still feel free to have it read? Yeah, it? I, I do actually get very frustrated with people always asking the exact color combinations and things and which specific paint do you need to do something and things like that. Because a lot of the time when I'm picking colors, I, I can, sometimes I just say, all right, I'm going to pick some random colors and see what I can come up with and things is a lot of it is to do with the application of the paint right. um, and things like that. And you don't have to worry about having the exact color. You can, you know, you know, just get by with whatever colors you've got really. Right. Um, yeah. It's just, I, I think maybe it's from like the, the games workshop style of painting because um, you know, to help people, they have very specific stages and you know they do the layering and the edging and things like that um and so people that kind of learn that uh, method and um you know to get a very specific look but i don't uh, which make is something else, else that makes it really hard for doing uh, painting guides i don't work like that i don't have a very specific um step one step two step three because right. i'm going back forwards all the time um you know so like oh does that need a little bit more color there or uh, you know all sorts of things like that and so it's much more kind of natural and kind of dynamic the way that you, you paint. Um, but it, it does make it harder to do kind of PDFs and things when people are like, oh, how do you do this? Right, right, right. No, I think that overall, here, here's, here is a statement I would make, and I, this is something that's come up on a couple of different past interviews, and I'm always fascinated by it. I don't find recipes valuable more or less at all other than very broadly speaking, if somebody says, well, I used a pretty reddish brown and, you know, I wanted something warm. So I kind of picked a warm white yellow or something like that, that mm -hmm. kind of idea, right? Like, okay. And I could probably unpack most of that by looking at it, but that kind of general 
tonal uh, instruction is about as useful as I generally find recipes to be. Right. Mm. Beyond that, like never a specific paint. Oh, it had to be, you know, ice yellow or something like that. Well, there's 10 no. different, you know, yeah. kinds of paints, like 20 different kinds of paints like that. Oh, you're all right. I got a dog too. I understand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dogs are frequent guest stars on this show. <laughs> yeah. <Cool. laughs> so, yeah, I mean, is, does that feel, uh, I don't know. Does that feel like it rings true to you or is that how you yeah, feel about it? Yeah, well? very much. Um, I will rarely uh, bother about a specific color. Like, uh, so I look at thousands and thousands of um, images of uh, what, like 2D paintings and model paintings and things like, you know, I, if, if I'm not painting, I'm probably looking at painting. Um, and I never really care what the, you know, to ask anyone what specific paints are used or anything like that. Um, and I can see what the colors are when I look at the image. So, you know, I can just do my own variation um, and, you know, get a pretty close exact uh, approximation anyway. Um, the only thing I would say is because there are very variations in um, the, uh, the qualities of paints bet between brands and not saying the qualities of how good they are, but, you, you know, the, the properties of the paints. Right. Um, so, you know, there's obviously scale 75 being super matte things and then the, the satin finish of Games Workshop paints and differences in glazing and all sorts of stuff like that. So that can make a difference. Um, but for the colors themselves, uh, I'm not really that bothered. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I do think it's one of those things that can be it's it's more useful for beginners because obviously they have no real clue of even where to go or what paints are mm -hmm. out there. So I think there is value there. But of course, as you go on, I, what, I, what I would encourage more people to do is to start experimenting more. I mean, that's kind of what I always think about, right? So don't don't hold yourself to just one brand. Find the finish you like. Understand the properties you paint. The best thing you can do is just paint more. That's probably the way to go. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're you're do you're you're in art. You have this artistic background. You start painting. Let's get let's move forward in time. Did you ever have the gap years? Uh, this is a common occurrence throughout there where people, they discover girls or they get too cool for school, right? Like, oh, I'm too cool now. I'm a, I'm an adult, right? I'm not going to do this stuff anymore. Did you ever have that gap or had, did you consistently just um, go throughout? I, I definitely had periods where I didn't necessarily stop with um, kind of models and painting, but I, they took a back burner. Um, very much uh, when I was at university, I didn't um, do much in the way of painting um, for models. Obviously, <laughs> to my degree, I was actually doing lots of 2D painting. Um, sure. So you're always still art. You were always still art. Yeah, there's, there's always a, a point where I'm doing art, um, just not always model painting. Nice. OK, got it. Now, I, I think the, so the main thing as well was like uh, as a teenager, I was desperate to win a golden demon. And then once I got my first Golden Demon, I think it was 1999. Um, after I got that, like I, I lost all ambition then to do any more. I just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> like you got it, you got there, you got yeah, the yeah. I, I got done. one, and then I was like, all right, that's it, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> one and done. So okay, let's let's drill in on that then. Next, let's talk to let's let's make the turn to competition painting. Because obviously you have a host of awards. We can't mention them all here, but there's a lot. You won a lot of awards uh, and well-deserved, uh, obviously, well-earned. Uh, now, here's the question. What did you immediately say when you were painting? You saw a Golden Demon was happening. Obviously, it was uh, in the 90s. There was no, you know, the internet wasn't as much of a thing. There wasn't as many places to see all these works and stuff like that. So you had to kind of just know about it. it had to be in. You had to be in the culture, right? Um, yeah. Things weren't shared. As, there's no. There's no Twitter, right? There's no yeah. Facebook. People aren't sharing all that stuff out everywhere. So where? Did, what made you uh, make that turn into competition painting? Was it just always like since you had already been competing in class and in sort of art class and stuff like that and winning? You just said, oh well, this is the kind of natural extension. Is it? Is it I just think that simple. I'm I'm a fairly competitive person anyway, um, and. But so it was uh, being competitive mixed with the fact that I just loved art. So I was just looking at the models all the time. And I was always more fascinated in the, the White Dwarves with the uh, the Golden Demon editions. Um, yeah, and I, I just loved what you know, what I saw there. So it, it made me want to do that. 
Um, quite often I, uh, I hear people when they, they see like an amazing model and it says it, they, that puts them off uh, from painting, but it had the opposite effect on me. And the more amazing the model, the more it encouraged me to want to kind of um, do better than what I could, than what I saw. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. It, it, you you saw it as the goal, right? As something to strive yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. No, I get it. I think you're right. I think there is. People sometimes have a bit of a bifurcated reaction to it, right? There's mm -hmm. one part it can be driving. It can be like you want to reach that place that get to that same level. I think some people respond to it by kind of saying like, oh, it's that common thing. I, I am guessing you've seen this in your posts because you post on social media plenty of time by the way all of richard's socials will be down below if you're not following him on instagram and twitter and everything else i don't know what you've done wrong with your life but please correct that immediately uh and the this is a post you'll see so tell me if you this rings true to you you post a picture and the response you get is snaps brushes or something <laughs> to that effect right yeah and I just want to be like, no, no, that's not at all. That's not what, why? why? No, no. I like, I love it when people say, oh, this has encouraged me. Um, and they want to try more. Like that's the response that I want. Every time I see the, um, throws model in the trash or snaps brushes and things like that. Um, it's quite a disheartening response to something that I've done. <laughs> right. Because you don't want to feel like you're actually discouraging people. Like, that's not why I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, I, I don't want to be putting stopping people from enjoying the hobby. Um. Yeah, part of what I, I and I know you obviously do this through to, as well, because you have a Patreon and you teach, you know, part of what you're trying to do is encourage people in the hobby. Like, yeah, that's the yeah goal. exactly. Um, I, I want to see people improve and like enjoy what they're doing and uh, enter competitions if that's what they like or not if they don't, but you know, whatever they like. Um, just to enjoy it <laughs> right 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 okay so completely agree now that first time the first golden demon you won was that the first one you went to or had you gone to several and then finally no i'd been okay. going for a long time i'd got so many final at the time they gave out uh, little certificates uh, i got so many of those like a whole stack of them um and of course like when you're a young teenager you're always like oh there's, there's some bias or whatever they're not picking me for some reason um of course it's just a case of what you're entering isn't good enough but um yeah i've been trying for quite a few years to uh to get a trophy all right so and the first one what what was what what did we have here on the first win what was the first win what was it for it and was, what did you win it was a warhammer fantasy monster and it was a uh, keeper of secrets um oh my god was this the 90s Keeper of Secrets? Uh, uh, yeah. The, yeah like, the little metal bull head claw? No, no, no. no. So, no, that was... That was um, right, so it was just released in the 90s. Like, it was... Was it 98? Okay. The, the, the one was released. So, because I had the one before that. I know the one that you're talking about. Because okay. it's, be it's beautiful, that model. Um, and I, I sold it as well. I was, I was like, why did I do that? <laughs> okay. Got it. So um, it's the one from '98. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, but because I like the the, the bullheaded one that you're talking about so much, I converted mine because when they brought it out, they'd got the claws on the bottom of the you know on the torso. Right. Um, and so I converted it to put them back on the top again because uh, it made no sense to me that they, <laughs> they'd uh, put the claws around the waist. Um, yeah. So, and like I added extra horns and things like that on it. Um, and like had a, a really actually quite uh, weird paint scheme on it. it had like all patterns painted all over it very dark and strange looking <laughs> uh, yeah well i do respect very much that your first win was for us the nesh model all as it should be <laughs> like as yeah. you, you gotta be striving if you're striving for perfection there is no greater <laughs> deity you can pledge yourself to than slanesh mm -hmm. that's the way to go so well done there Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gotten a chance to play with the new uh, Keeper of Secrets at all? Obviously, the you know the the this last year's yeah. Game I saw that. I fell in love with it straight away. I thought as soon as I saw that, I'm going to turn that into a Golden Demon entry, and it stayed in the box ever since I've got it. <laughs> it's just that's all right. It's just cooking. That's just the preheat. Yeah, things. yeah. I mean, I have I have um, ideas in my head for what I want to do with it. Um, 
but it's just getting around to it, you know, so many models, so little time. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, that leads me to another question. Do you have a painted army? You paint a lot of figures for <laughs> oh, for an army based game. Do you have a finished army? Um, technically, yes. I have a small Adeptus Titanicus army. Okay, that counts. But the, re but the reason for that is because you only need like um, so I've got three Titans and uh, three Knights painted for it. So <laughs> it's quite uh, a minimal army. Um, and I suppose if you include uh, my painting from when I was younger, uh, I do have an Imperial Fist and a Death Guard army, um, but I don't use those anymore. Those are just um, stuck in a cabinet. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. No, I mean, I, again, you've made the right choices with both of those. Uh, <laughs> so well done, you. Uh, I am also a huge fan of the Imperial Fists. I just find yellow yeah. to be a super fun color to paint. Like, it's such an interesting... Uh, yeah uh scheme of what you can do with yellow the way you can make it warm the way you can make it cold it responds to lighting changes really well things like damage and stuff like that just show up really fun and, and, yeah. and visually interesting on yellow so i i love everything about the imperial fist for their color and death guard is the only acceptable nurgle it's usually a lot of fun because you get to play with all of the they nurgle is gross and i have a well-known bias against it i can't stand painting nurgle stuff but i love painting death guard because they're nice yeah. enough to trap all their grossness inside armor <laughs> and then you still get to play with all the fun Nurgle stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is always I, great. What I like about Nurgle stuff is you can go crazy with the colors. Absolutely right. crazy. You don't have to just have, like, rotten or green. <laughs> um, you know, you can just do whatever color you want. If you go, if you want to um, use some real-world research and just look at all different diseases and, like, just even bruises and things like that, um, there's just so many colors on them that you can go for. Um, it's actually quite freeing to, to go with Nurgle, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. And because we, even when you just think about the nature of, you know, rusting, oxidation, weathering, bruises, boils, disease and all that, you've just hit every color of the rainbow across that spectrum. Right. Like yeah. right there, your your model has the potential to, to play in any space you want. And that's really sort of liberating. There's also something really fun about being able to tell that extra narrative through that thing that I really enjoy about those models. Like when you're doing a shiny ultra clean, perfect sort of Marine type of guy, like that has a narrative to it. And it's very standard. Like that guy has clean yeah. armor and that's it. I can't tell more of a story about a battle that they're in or a situation. I, you know, I, I tend to like things that look a little more worn for that reason. They feel like they have more going on. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it just tells a bit more story having, you know, even just small amounts of damage, you know, how did they get that scrape or that, chip and things like that um it's just a bit more interesting yeah exactly and i think we're going to see that really well because you i you i think you incorporate that into uh the knights and stuff you've painted really well yeah so and that's one thing i want to drill in on so obviously you do a lot of different types of figures you're great with with all these different things that interest you but one of the things that i am always most impressed by and that initially drew me to your work was your work on big robots you know on these 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 night titans uh who doesn't like big robots yeah exactly that's it's super great right like it's the most fun thing so what what got you into wanting to try uh you know knights to to doing that stuff like what what drew you to that as a uh you know as a figure that you wanted to paint um i think it uh so in my early years i used to love um space marine um epic kind of um games and they had obviously the titans in those uh and i loved the titans so much um and that just always stuck with me so when um forge world started releasing uh, you know their big kits right. um i just I had to have them all <laughs> of course I, I got a warlord as well i bought it it's in a box it's never come out <laughs> that's that's the the you're gonna paint a small child project yes yeah ex exactly yeah i was like oh i'm gonna cover it in freehand and things I was like well this is gonna take me the rest of my life if i do this <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean just the prep and clean up alone right yeah. like you get into it you're gonna be there for a couple couple weeks at mins you know so yeah it's uh it's a heck of a project uh so uh, one of the things that i think is interesting and I, i'd love to your take on it is 
I think knights combine kind of everything in the discipline because you do get to tell a narrative. You do get to play with weathering. You have big flats where you get to experiment with freehand and, and illustration. You have you get to incorporate scale modeling techniques. They're they're mm -hmm. kind of easy to play around with conversions and stuff like that. I they I, I just think that they represent a very unique opportunity. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I, I fell in love with them. Do you, yeah. do you find the same thing? Like you just say, I can throw the whole toolbox at this. Yeah. You, you can do whatever you want. They're, they're a massive canvas. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, I think that's exactly right. Uh, all right. So, uh, as you've gone along, you've competed for, you know, in many years in, in all these different, uh, elements, all these different competitions using all these different figures. Um, what sort of is there any that stand out in your mind that you worked on that you were particularly happy with over the over the years for for some reason or another? No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> fair answer. Um, I always find once I've finished a model, um, I kind of ignore it, and then it's on to the next one. Um, sometimes it's interesting to like so I just stick it in the cabinet or whatever, um, unless. Uh, games workshop have it on display um you know it's just left in the cabinet and then i probably won't even look at it <laughs> for years so um it is quite interesting to go back to a model that i painted uh, a while ago and then look at it with fresh eyes um and then i tend to usually find that i actually prefer it because um a lot of the large models that i do are very uh they when it comes up to a competition anyway it gets very stressful the painting um, and I always kind of feel like I'm destroying my paintwork because I've usually I've started painting it and it's you know I've spent time on it and you know just leisurely painted it going along and then I was like oh you've got a week left and you've got to paint the other half of the model and so you have to like really knuckle down and get it painting right. painted but um, then you lose that time to just you know look at it every other day and decide does it need tweaks and things like that you know. Um, I'm never happy with something. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the same with most people. Um, but I just get I get quite cross when it comes up to a competition and I always feel like I'm ruining a model <laughs> just before I, I enter it. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is something I wanted to drill in on, sort of your emotional connection to, to the work that you've completed. I always try to tell people that you should try to be happy but never satisfied is kind of mm. my thing. But I find I often have a love-hate relationship with work that I've done. Like I look at it and I just all I, I I often feel like ugh, you like you just see the flaws. So how do you like it, do, how do you relate with your work that you've completed? Do you do you find that you like do you look at them and go oh yeah that's that's great? Do you ever look at a piece you do and say that's great? Wouldn't change a thing. Nailed it. Uh, no, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, like, sometimes I look at it and think um, that looks pretty cool, um, and you know I, I'm reasonably happy with how it's turned out or whatever. But uh, also, like if you're doing a, a larger project, um, I'll find that my taste changes while I'm going through on it, and then I'm like, oh, I probably would have painted uh, another bit differently. Um, and if I wasn't painting it for a competition, so it had to be done by a certain date, then I probably would go back and change things. But you have to be a little bit careful with that as well, because then you get locked into a stage where you're constantly repainting something uh, and changing it. Um, so you kind of have to just be strict with yourself and finish it anyway. Um, but yeah, I, no, I'm never, never satisfied with a, a project. Uh, there's never a, a stage where I think, oh, I, I couldn't have done that any better. Um, and like I, I'm pretty confident that whatever model I painted, um, if I just spend longer on it, I can make it look better. It's just a case of how much do you want to invest in uh, one particular model. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, all right. So as you're painting now, so you, as I, as I, we kind of were talking before the show, and one of the things I mentioned was you, you keep a lot of work in progress going. You have a lot of whips. You share them out. Um, I'm fascinated by this, as I mentioned pre-show, because I'm like a unitasker type of person. You know, I, I pick one, I will go through, I will take that through until it is logically done. I'll set it to the side. Usually if it's for competition, I will come back in the month before the competition and try to re-fix it, go look at it with fresh eyes, find things I didn't do, right, that kind of thing. But 
when you're painting along, how do you, you sit down at your table. You've got several different whips you're in right now. What's guiding you? What are you picking up? Is it just what catches your fancy that day or, or what's, uh, what's making that decision? There's a few things. So there's, um, one, do I need to get something finished, um, for tutorials that I've already started? Uh, is it for a competition that needs to get done? Um, is it a new model and I'm particularly excited about it? Um, or is it just something that I want to try something out on, uh, like, you know, a different technique or like refine a technique or something like that? Um, because I do, I find that I've got the attention span of a goldfish uh, for painting models. <laughs> um, and it's so easy for me to get bored of doing something. So I can, I tend to, I actually work quite quickly. Um, and so, <laughs> like, for an example, um, Mortarian, when I was painting that, um, people were like, oh, you've been painting that for so long, you must have spent, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours on it. Um, and to be fair, I did spend a few hours on it, but it's nowhere near as many hours as people think because I've worked very quickly on a small section and then just put it away. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Leave it, yeah. So you're, you're like, okay, well, we'll do that whole, his whole plasma gun, like where that's at. And then we put it aside and you come back to it a couple weeks later yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Right on. Uh, do you listen to anything while you're painting? Like what do you, what do you have to keep your, your interest up while you're going? Again, like my, my attention span is so short. Uh, I, I tend, sometimes I just put YouTube on and just let it flow through what <laughs> you end up going down some sure. weird rabbit holes of, of whatever pops up. Um, I it rec YouTube has got some awful recommendations for me just because of, I've had things pop up on there that it's carried on watching. <laughs> nice nice uh yeah. <laughs> i find i'm the same way because you, you get into the zone where it just it, you let it you're you're working and it's just like yep sure whatever that's fine just i need it's it's a background noise thing i think yeah exactly yeah um because i, I don't really uh, pay that much attention to what i'm listening to um i do find that i like uh, kind of softer sounds and things like that so if i have music on i won't have anything that's too um energetic which i know is uh, a lot of people like really dramatic music when when they paint um but i actually uh, i focus so much when i paint and um so I, I wear like a fitbit type watch and it tells like when i finish painting it asks me did i have a good sleep because i've <laughs> <laughs> you know i've focused so much and i've like relaxed so much while i'm doing it um yeah. That is that is amazing. What that means is that you've truly like you have achieved what many sort of Zen masters have have sought after over the ages because you're entering this sort of flow state, right, of just calm yeah, yeah. where you're there. So that is amazing that it that it actually you've kind of relaxed down and you're that drilled in. That's pretty wonderful. That's fantastic. All right, sir. Uh, so we come up to the current day. Uh, you know, you've obviously continued competition painting throughout. You're still working on stuff. Uh, you've got projects going right now. Obviously, this year uh, we got the, you've got the potential for a couple different uh, Golden Demons because you're going to come over in the U.S. You're going to, I assume, still you know be at Warhammer Fest and whatnot. So, uh, what for those who aren't following you yet? What have you been working on so far? Uh, if if you don't mind sharing, I don't want to pry or anything, but like, what are you working on right now that, that you're excited about? Um, so I have two main uh, things that I'm excited about at the moment. Uh, one is, uh, I think we're going to actually have a look at the photo of it later, the uh, loon boss on Giant Cave Squig. Um, I, uh, I loved that model when it came out, but it was only available in the... Um, the Loon Curse box set or something like that. Right. And of course, I didn't, I didn't buy the box set when it came out because I, I wasn't hadn't actually been paying that much attention to how Games Workshop were doing their uh, release thing. So I just assumed that, you know, if there's a model, it'll be available. Right. Um, you just go get that <laughs> single model. Believe yeah, exactly. me when I tell you, many regular <laughs> AOS players have assumed the same and have been very sad. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I was just kicking myself. But um, my friend Andy had... Uh, got the set and he's like, oh, well, I've got this model and it's just going to sit in the drawer. Um, so uh, he, he let me uh, have that. And uh, I, I just love it. It's, um, it's such a simple model, um, but there's a lot you can do with it. You know, it's, 
um, I, I find sometimes uh, the models that are released now have so much detail on and it's kind of crammed in there. Um, and it's I don't find that so much fun to paint with all the small details because it doesn't allow me to be very expressive. Like you kind of locked in a little bit um, with how you can paint them just because, you know, everything's a, you know, everything's a detail. So you can't like do nice, smooth transitions or just have like a clean area uh, and, you know, paint your own thing on it. Um, Whereas, you know, with, with that loon boss, um, I felt I could. Uh, the other thing that I'm um, most excited about at the moment that I'm painting is Nagash. Um, and you can see that on the on my social media as well. Um, but for him, so I looked at the, uh, the, the box art for that and the model is really, really nice, but there is so much going on. It's like covered in ghosts flying around him. Right. Uh, things like that. It's just a massive model. Um, but I um, remembered Nagash from the previous incarnation. Now, that was a pretty terrible model. Little, Famously, um, the clown Nagash, yes. Little clown, clown Nagash. Clown. Although I loved it at the time when I got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, in the 90s when I was playing, that fig was amazing, right? I mean, I, I look at some of my early decisions and tastes. Like, I remember when I looked at the the war altar, if you remember that thing from the 90s originally, like the Volkmar guy who had his arms up in the air and he was on that little flat altar with the griffin behind yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. I thought, oh my God, this is the coolest thing I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. This is amazing. And now I look at it and I think, oh boy, did I have some yeah. bad choices and taste. But, you know, we, did, we were comparing them against different things then. Um, you know, there wasn't quite the... Uh, like the technology for producing models and right. things wasn't quite so good and things like that. But yeah, so I was looking at Nagash and I, like, I loved the old artwork. I think it's Mark Gibbons artwork that um, had done a version of Nagash. And like, that's how I always pictured him. And so when I looked at the new version, I was like, I don't like that he's flying and he's got all these ghosts around him and everything. It's kind of too much for me. So I just went and I've cut all of that off. Um, and like I've cut off his little um, bone beard thing that he has and closed his mouth so he's not screaming um, uh, and all sorts of things like that. I mean, they're not massive um, conversions. Uh, they're fairly simple. I did sculpt on some hair as well uh, because I'm doing this thing where I want some movement in the model. So I've, I've sculpted on a small um, kind of cloth on his waist because I cut off some more stuff there, which is blowing to the side and the hair on his... Uh, head is blowing to the side as well. So, and when I do the base, it's going to be some long grass. And so it's all going to be blowing in the wind, basically. Gotcha. Um, try and get, you know, a bit of movement on the piece where he, the, the model himself is going to be quite uh, static. Um, nice. Yeah. But he's going to be like, he's very strongly uh, non metallic metal as well. Um, just because I enjoy painting it. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, he's he's looking amazing, and I like that sort of stripping it back. I completely agree on the detail thing. I think it's actually, like, one of my main pet peeves is because the technology has advanced, right, of sculpting, and we can, you know, in ZCAD, you can get in there and get these ultra-fine details, and the the technology for doing the, the, uh, the plastic mold is so precise, right? The way you sort of three-up sculpt the mold, you can do these micro-details, Right. That, that just we would that you would have never really been able to do when you were forced to work from like even even a three up in green stuff. Right. You wouldn't have been or yeah. in that kind of yeah. thing. You wouldn't have been able to capture it. Um, they would have just got lost when you shrunk the mold. And uh, I just find often it's noise. Right. It becomes mm -hmm. stuff that I, I would rather have uh, negative space to let the eye kind of breathe and relax yeah, as exactly. it's moving around the figure. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm all about contrast on models, and by that I don't I don't mean like color contrast or tonal contrast, but I mean like contrast in textures, contrast right. in like spaces. Like, I, you just sometimes you just need a bit of open space just to show off the details. Right. Um, yeah. Because otherwise, like detail with detail with detail just means a a, a hot mess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's it's it becomes static. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the most if you switch your TV to, you know, a channel with static, if TV still do that, I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> I, you're an old okay. person. Uh, you know, that's a lot of visual information. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of tiny dots and it all amounts to nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it, like there's there's something to be said for having uh, simplicity in the figure. Um, so, no, that's fantastic. 
how much do you, this is something I've noticed. This is actually, so this is a question I have. This is completely, this is Vince's question for Vince. Here we go. Uh, but a question I've never thought to ask you in person whenever we've talked. When you're doing some nights, how often do you sculpt is the basic question and, ch and change the figures? Because I've noticed on some of your night shoulder pads, I feel like you cut away some of the pieces and smoothed them out. Like, so knights famously have this arrow for anybody who's done a knight knows they have this like arrow on there that separates, uh, uh, the two halves of the shoulder pad. And I noticed on a bunch of your knights, that's not present. I was like, Oh, did he cut that away and then yeah. smooth it all out? But so you had a bigger flat space. So yeah, th is that what you're doing? <laughs> There's my question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I think every night that I've painted, I've done that on. <laughs> And so, and I noticed it on the leg panels too. And I was like, gosh, darn it. That's such a good idea because that, that break often just gets in the way of what you want to do. And it means yeah. you've got to do like two images instead of one. It switches everything around. It really shit. It really breaks the space. Yeah. Um, I, I know why Games Workshop do it because it, you know, it adds to the, you know, the Gothic feel of the, the models and things like that. Right. But I, I just, and I suppose you know, for, for those of us that want to, the option is there to take it off. So it's easier to take it off than it would be to add it. Um, but yeah, I uh, like, like we're saying, I just love like um, clean space on a model. Um, and not just for freehand, but it is nice to have that option. Right. To put some freehand on it. <laughs> Uh, so do you find yourself making those kinds of small changes at the, you know, at the prep phase pretty often with your models? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a very good sculptor, really. It's not something that I'm that interested in. I'm all about the, the painting, really. But I do like to make my models individual. So I'll just do like a simple head swap or, you know, cut some detail off or things like that. Just simple things. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, I'm, I'm glad I finally got my question answered that I've had for, for a long time. So good. This has all been worth it. No. <laughs> all right, sir. So let's look at uh, let's look at some of your pieces. I kind of want you to. And the idea here is just we're going to bring them up and I'll have you share some of the stories behind them, what you like about them, what you don't like about them. Just any thoughts you've got uh, on them. Share and share away. So let's okay. get into it. Uh, so this will cover up your face. So you're off camera for a little while. So don't worry if you, okay. need, to, you need to, you know, you're, you're good to go. But here we go. We will start uh, with the, we'll, we'll start with the night, uh, with your night haunt character here. This is like the grim, grim hailer, grim hauler, grim something. He's a spooky boy. It's some Something the grim hailer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so this guy, I believe you entered in 2019's uh, Worm yeah. Fest. This is where I saw him in person. Uh, I absolutely love this figure. You like, I've never seen anybody utilize these types of, of colors. So it's very eye catching. Uh, I, I love the light of the, and warmth of the red contrasted against that, like extreme electric blue, but at a deeper level, I think the thing that I, I most enjoy about your take on this is using the blue energy within things like the ribs and the holes and the shadows to create, you know, color in the deep shadow contrast. Uh, but yeah, tell us about this guy. Yeah, so um, when I, I got this, um, this was actually a model that I was um, kind of sent, uh, you know, to for like review purposes. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this? Um, it looks really cool, but it has these massive wings on. Right. And I looked at the wings. I was like, I just don't like them. They cut the model in half. Um, so, you know, if you look at it from a uh, side on view, uh, you kind of either see the, the bottom half or the, the top half. And I was like, but the model as a, a whole looks so cool. So I was like, right, instantly I'm going to throw those away. Um, it did leave some holes. Uh, I, <laughs> But rather foolishly, I'd already kind of I'd airbrushed some red on the model and things like it was already uh, prepped when I threw them away. Um, I was like, right, so now I've got to, I'm going to sculpt over it. And then I, I was so eager to get going on the model that like I, I made a little bit of a mess, um, this sculpt filling in the, the holes because it was such a simple area. Right. It's, it's on the, the shoulder bone kind of part of the horse. Um, if I really thought about it, I would have made those a, a bit better. But um, <laughs> apart from that, I think, you know, just taking the wings away just instantly brings the, the model to life. Um, well, you can actually see the whole model at once. Exactly. You're right. Because yeah. no matter almost what angle you look at it from with the wings, 
it, they're they're obscuring stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And and they also are just a a big block to what is the body and the face and the action the the the, the area of the model you're actually trying to focus your attention on can so often be obscured by by them so i no, i actually love this choice i think he looks great without the wings mm -hmm. and the other thing about i mean just the wings themselves they're very flat um i so i wish that they could be a little bit more dynamic with the shape of how they do wings sometimes um you know just so that they kind of fit in with the the aesthetic of the figure and like the composition um but yeah in, in this case like you know, i was happy with the result anyway um uh, but then, so I was painting it, but this wasn't intended to be a golden demon piece. I was just painting this, and I was like, oh, it's a cool model, I'll paint it up. Um, right. I loved all the Night Haunt that came out. And as is usually the case when Games Workshop releases some new stuff, I'm like, right, I'm going to build an army. And like, I'd ordered. <laughs> there it is. Like, just, yeah, I just ordered the whole Night Haunt collection. Um, of course, most of them are still in boxes, but. <laughs> um, I just wanted to come up with, a, you know, uh, an interesting color scheme and things like that. Um, and you know, so I was like, well, I want a kind of like a, a contrasting uh, thing going on uh, with the red, um, but you know, and that would like be green. Everyone's like, you know, red and green, but then it looks like Christmas, and it's like, Ugh. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I try and stay away from um, red and green combinations, really. And people are like, oh, you know, you should never do red and blue. And I was like, right, I'll do red and blue then. So uh, just because. Um, I like to be contrary sometimes. Yeah, sure. I mean, and and I've I, I oftentimes it's I think those rules are like things like that are they're good guidelines, God, but they're, every, they're every, not uh, they're not hard rules. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but the thing is, like, it's it's good to know the rules yes. um, and then to understand you know why they work and things like that. I also think you did a nice touch here by pushing the red into the brighter color, right? So yeah. you've pushed it into this more orangey red tone, yeah. high yeah. highlights, and that, that really helps it sync with the blue. The blue is also highly desaturated, so that's good. Yeah, exactly. So like you, I, I'm cheating because it, it's not really a, a red-blue <laughs> combination. Um, and if you actually look at it, there's not really very much red or blue on there. Um, it just looks like that. Um but yeah, so I, I was just playing around with it really. Um, I, and uh, it, as it was going along, I just thought like I really like how it looked. But the the problem was, so it's a it's one of the kind of like easy build models, yep, um, which are great, but also a pain because they don't have many pieces, and this has a lot of. Um, because like it's a ghost like yeah type sure. thing yeah it's like you can see inside it all the way around like you see inside the ribs like it either from the underside and everything like that but because of the the snap fit type um aspect of it there's going to be massive gaps everywhere if you don't fill them in before painting right so you have to pretty much pre-build it i could leave the ghost off um but apart from that the, the model was completely built um but that just made it horrible to try and paint on the inside <laughs> Um, how which, often are you working in in like how much do you sub assemble your things? Obviously, we everybody sub assembles to some degree, right? Like writers, yeah. being a classic stuff like that you just mentioned. How granular do you get when you break down your figures? Um, it really depends. I'm quite lazy. I don't like sub assemblies too much, and there's a good reason for that. Um, is that when you focus on painting a small section of a model and you paint all the small sections and you stick it together and then you find actually none of that works together like the right. lighting is consistent or things like that um you'll get much better result overall if especially if you're working with lighting on the model if you um build it all and then paint it as one piece um if like obviously the sensible thing to do would be to look for sections that you could leave off and then like blue tack them on or whatever um, and take them off as you paint them, things like that, uh, just so you can keep checking. But uh, generally speaking, I prefer to build models as much as possible. Um, but then you come to something like Mortarian, and you just can't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Well, we'll talk more about him when we get to that Oh, picture, yeah, we'll but... get there. We'll get there. <laughs> He's coming. Yeah. No, this is great. And I love the touch of the green. Did you add any of that fire to him, or is that all? Is all the no, little smoky, fiery bits all, on there? All, um, all part of the model standard. Uh, yeah. So all I did was cut the wings off and fill in the uh, the holes. 
I think it's a great example of like I can tell that the sculptors also are people who enjoy painting because it's this kind of thing that just feels like they built it with a painter in mind. The way the fire's placed, it actually feels like it was there to balance, right? You have this nice you have these nice it's, color circles that happen naturally. Yeah. It's it's such a nice sculpt. Um I, I mean I really like the, the small statue at the bottom as well. That works really well uh, compositionally. Um I mean, it, this was actually a, a really interesting model for me to paint as well, because uh, so I did it very much uh, to get away from the the um, kind of weathered, um, you know, heavily textured kind of uh, work that I'd been doing. So this is a very smooth and clean. Um, people are like, oh, you've airbrushed it, or whatever. So I, I, there's some red airbrush to start with, but you can't see any of the red paint on it now. Right, right, right. By the time I finished painting over it so much, um, it was more just kind of like a guide for me, so kind of like a zenithal uh, undercoat almost. Um, yeah, so this, I mean, this was just like a, a fun project for me, but then as it went along, I was like, oh, actually, I really like how it looks, so I'll kind of like up the painting level on it. Yep. Um, but because of the, the start of it and how I, you know, I hadn't really spent that much time making sure like the, the finish would be perfect and like painting on the inside of it and things. And just because it isn't a uh, heavily detailed painting, so I mean, there isn't any like freehand or texture or anything like that on it really. Um, so it's, it would, it was always going to struggle in the golden demon. Um, it's still got, um, what's it? The commended certificate. Yeah. The commended entry. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They're like the joint fourth place type. Yes. They do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, which i'm glad I, they do because yeah, it's, I mean, it's nice I mean, everyone, what... everyone calls it joint fourth place but there's like three or four models to get it so. right 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 uh i'm glad they added it it was something they did yeah. i understand back in the back in the 90s and or, yeah. and it's it the point it, i think is well well taken especially in stuff like single figure where yeah exactly. there's going to be a top three but the next 10 are so close or whatever, yeah. you know, the next X number, you can pick whatever it is, yeah. right? Well, it's like, like we were talking about before we started, where, um, where I said, like, um, if you're entering one of the single miniature categories, you should really be able to paint to a gold standard in any of the other categories, because there are models that won't place in the single figure categories that would win gold in the other categories. Right. So, you know, it's a, they're tough categories, fantasy single and 40k single. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hundreds of entries in there, all stunning quality. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So let's take a look now at so this guy's work in progress. But next up, we have the the aforementioned uh, loon boss on Cave Squig. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I talked about him. I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, that's okay. good. <laughs> yeah, now, now they can see what's referenced. It's all good. Uh, I, what I love about this guy is. This is a great example of working a lot of, of texture and life into the spaces because he is a relatively simple fig. Like it's a beach ball with a goblin on top, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And and yet when you look at things like the tongue and where you've added all the detail there, things mm -hmm. like the skin and the the demon dots and the color transitions, that the um everything feels very organic where it's supposed to feel organic. The armor feels very much like armor. Like you've really made the texture feeling come through here. Mm -hmm. What what I found with this model is because it's so clean. Like I could, I, I've kind of like just thrown everything at it. I've just gone mad. Um, I don't, there's one thing that I don't think the the photos that I take really show is how small the goblin is on top. Yeah, <laughs> he's a tiny uh, little boy. He's he is very small. Um, I was trying to paint the eyes on him, so I've painted the. Uh, the eyes, the iris, the pupil, and the, the white reflected dot. And um, that was driving me insane. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, you, you don't usually bother to put an iris on a model that small. Um, and it's not too bad. You think you've got it right, because you have to do both at the same time so they match up. Right. And then then you put the white dot on, but the white dot has to be so precise. And when you put the white dot on, then it just breaks up the whole thing. You messed it up, and you've got to start again. Um, it took me a couple of hours just to do two eyes. I I think that will just make everybody who's watching this feel much better because I, I think eyes are always traditionally a, a source of pain. So hearing that this one caused you a little consternation is probably a, a, a good thing for other people listening out there. 
Yeah, I I really like uh, you know when they have Marines with like one bionic eye. <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. The the bionic eye on the side of the head is just like, oh, thank God, this is going to be so much easier to balance, right? Yeah, exactly. Or if you cut, like, if you, you still don't fancy, just put a like a scar going straight through his eye. There you go. Yes, yeah. go for the go for the old scar white eye trick. Yeah, I mean, yeah. hey, and that's very Warhammer. I mean, how many yeah. pictures, right? Uh, a lot of a lot of Space Marines and Sisters of Battle have apparently taken glancing blows to <laughs> a very specific part of their face and come out okay. So yeah. that's great. Uh, and you added the banner to this, right? That was uh, uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I got the like, I, I again I bought every single Goblin model that came out. The the Gloom Spike gets. Um, I just loved them. Uh, I loved the got the Night Goblins when I was a kid, um, but the majority of them were metal models, and I couldn't afford you know, to have an army like that. So sure. I thought, right, I'm just going to get them all now. Uh, I love them all, and of course they're all in boxes. <laughs> but but um, I had <laughs> I had started painting some of the um, the squig hoppers. I can't remember what they called it. So the squig hoppers and this, these other guys with lances. Um, but the guys with lances have um, like more like plate armor, like this guy. Right. And um, I thought, oh, that's really cool. So they're like knights riding uh, squigs. And um, I said, like, well, what do knights have? Knights have like pennants on their um, lances. So that's what I did here. I thought I, I just, I got a, a sheet piece of plastic, glued it on, uh, heated it with a, a heat gun and just twirled it backwards and instant um, pennant. <laughs> nice, nice. You know, one of the things I really enjoy about uh, your work and work like this, and I want to draw the viewer's attention to, is the very, very micro details that are, are simple when you look at it, but people often don't think of it. So yeah. I want to actually direct everybody's attention to the teeth of the, the squig. And so let's let's take a look at these teeth because it's it's and the tongue will be good, too. There's stuff like this that I think people often don't think about. Uh, so teeth are often wet, especially in a big squig's mouth where he's got a big tongue. I imagine he is a creature that salivates heavily. Uh, it just seems like it, right? It seems like he would be a drippy boy. Yeah. And you've added this small white dot, right, in your deep shadow at the base of the teeth to show mm. that there's sort of a wetness. And it's, it's there on the tongue as well, where you've got, put these light catches. Effectively, these light catches that you're using really, really, I think, smartly because it sells a sort of glossy effect, but yeah. you know, there's no gloss gel on that or, well, exactly. or something like that. It just sells yeah. the effect. So uh, people, so you have the option uh, when you're doing models. You can either go for kind of like effect paints where you put like gloss and things on um, to create the effect. But I'm never really a fan of that. Um, or rather, I like to challenge myself to kind of make it look like that rather than having it actually be glossy. Um, it's not that either um, method is better. It's just, you know, my preference is just to kind of like test myself to see if I can make it look like that. Right. No, I think it's very successful here. It's, it's just amazing how much a tiny detail like that actually sells that feeling, right? Because yeah. if that wasn't there, just that one little dot, that light catch does is doing some real heavy lifting. So it's... You know, it's just one of those things that I wanted to certainly draw people's attention to. I've actually realized that the, the photo that I've sent you, I've got a, a, um, an updated photo of this actually on my uh, Instagram. Um, so you can see where I've worked on the banner a little bit more, um, where it's got like all weathering on it. So it will kind of separate the banner a bit more from the uh, the blue on the model. Nice. Yeah, exactly. I was going to ask, it's funny you say that, because that's one of the things I was going to ask about, like, how are you going to separate more of the blue from the banner? <laughs> so, hey, there you go. Uh, well, I'll, I will, your Instagram will be linked down below so everybody can go check that out. All right. Uh, next up we have, this is a, this is a fun little guy. Uh, this is Zarbag of Zarbag's Gets Fame. Uh, our little Zobla, our little goblin spellcaster, uh, from yeah. the Underworld set. Yeah, I, I love this model so much. I, uh, I got this set purely, uh, because I liked him. Again, it's, you know, that, that night goblin look to him, um, I particularly like that he has one giant eye eyeball um, because you, um, so one is asymmetric. So again, you don't have quite so much of that issue with making the eyeballs match. Right. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is because it's so big, it, you can do a lot with it. So I've got like the the uh, reflection from his little fairy thing um, catching in the light there. Um, 
and I just love like you know the whole composition of the piece. I love the hook, uh, which, you know, it's perfect shape for doing non-metallics because you know like curved shapes are so much right. easier to paint uh, with a non-metallic effect. Um, the only thing I wish I'd done was put him on a different base and done my own base. Um, I kind of hate sculpted bases. Uh, and I well, originally I hadn't planned to, planned to spend as much time making them as neat as I did. Um, and then I was like, oh, I'll just knock out the base quickly. Um, so I might actually try and see if I can get him off the base and do a, a new base. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's there. Uh, like, I like the mushrooms. I like it, but I'm, I'm with you on the sculpted bases. I often just set those to the side. I think the only one I've used recently that I actually liked was, um, the one for the sister superior that I'm pretty sure Darren uh, Latham sculpted the 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 first one that they released right the oh right yeah yeah battle and she's on kind of the uh, like a that temple round. dais or whatever yeah, yeah. yeah which I thought was fun just because I liked the I liked the sort of temple marble cathedral mm. feeling to it so also, that works very well as like a display kind of plinth right. for it as well yeah yeah because it has it's big compared to her it's actually rather large compared to her. Right, as opposed mm -hmm. to this one where he's taking up a lot of space on here, uh, in the detail. So yeah, absolutely. Uh no, this is great. I love the I love the 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 light catch is so subtle, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a great example of oftentimes with OSL less is more. Like yeah. you don't it's he's not exploding in the yellow color of his firefly, right? No, exactly. It's actually something that drives me nuts when I see people do OSL and they use an airbrush. <laughs> and they just go, and you know, you've got like a this massive glow coming out of it. I was like, well, you know, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, this makes it feel much more subtle. Like it is a soft light, and he's in a, a relatively, you know, sort of cold, moonlit environment, and there's this little warm light he's he's using. So yeah, I think that's it's a great example of how uh, oftentimes, if you really want to sell some effect like this, the answer is do less of the effect. Which is counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, but well, so the problem is sometimes, when, like, so people paint the model and then they try and make the glow, uh, make make the glow work by making the glow brighter, but actually just make the model darker. Right. <laughs> uh, the glow works on it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. You cannot. Uh, you can't light a match without creating a shadow, and you can't do OSL without deepening. You yeah. Know, your because shadows, if right? the model is actually that bright the you know the the effect of it must be in daylight or something like that if you painted it such a light model so actually a light source wouldn't really have any effect in front of it if it's out in the daylight yeah exactly it's if you walk out at noon outside and it's a sunny day so i understand this might be a rarity in england that you can do this <laughs> what's uh, that <laughs> <laughs> but when you walk outside if it's a sunny day and you you light a torch or flashlight right uh you don't see it like nothing happens it doesn't really do much because yeah, because you're more competing like with the sun. Your, your little torch is competing with the light of the sun. So. Right, exactly. Uh, all right, no, this guy is wonderful. Um, I also enjoy, there's the, the, one of the things that I always try to impress upon people with things like goblins especially is to do more with the skin than just be in tones of green. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, there's so much potential with goblin and orc skin to work in other interesting tones and colors. And I really mm -hmm. like the the ones you've used here, especially around his eyes and in his nose, his lip, you know, this little, this little hangly it, dangly it is, he's got on there. It is a really nice thing with goblins. So goblins are so easy to paint because they're small, but they have big hands and big heads. Yeah. So you, you're not kind of struggling with the detail. And because so they're, they're very quick and easy to paint because you don't, don't have a lot of area but because the the face is big you can spend more time on that still to make it look nice you know you, you have that area to work with um yeah so it's a lot of fun to do and experiment with yep agreed it's it's basically they have like a almost you know normal human-sized head on a tiny little body so yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. The exaggerated proportions. It also makes them naturally eye catching because you're you're the the figure itself is forcing your viewer's eye to where you want them to look. It's it's a bit of a sculpting cheat on your behalf, which is great. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we have uh, a couple pictures from your. Uh, this is the wolfhound, right? That's this guy. This type. Warhound. 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 Sorry. Okay. I don't know all their different names. Despite loving <laughs> them, I can never keep them all straight. So, yes, this is the Warhound. Okay, I apologize. So, I'll start on the whole picture, and then we have the zoom in on the carapace. But, yeah, take us through uh, through this guy. I mean, this is, I think, 
this is some of the first stuff of your work that I saw that really dialed me in on you. Like I had seen your previous stuff and I, I had liked it. And that's not in any way a negative judgment. I just think when I saw this and I saw especially your your blog and stuff where you're going through and showing kind of the step by steps on it, this got me dialed in. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold on. You know, this is like, okay, time to time to to follow in. I think this is what really just blew me away, this piece. Yeah. Um so again, I love uh, giant robots. Um I previously uh, painted a Warhound uh, a long time ago. Um, and I remember I posted it on Cool Mini or Not, and it did really well. It scored like in the nines something. Um, and then people uh, became really interested in trying to commission me to paint Titans. Um, and it got to a stage where I was like, right, well, I can paint a lot better now. So I'm just going to do another Titan and just go crazy on it. Um, however, I say go crazy, so it, it obviously has a lot of freehand on it, but uh, still keep within the um, the context of a, like a Games Workshop IP piece. Um, I think sometimes when people see that they have like these large panels and you can, um, you know, put whatever you want on it, they uh, they go maybe a bit over the top, or you know, just they start painting freehand on something that might not necessarily uh, fit the style of the model. Um, so I was trying. I I really strongly had that in mind that I um, wanted it to fit within. Um, well, I did lots of research for the uh, the, the Titan Legion um, Legio. Um, anyway, uh, and so all that research and everything went into the the freehand. So to make sure that it was kind of accurate. Yeah, and so this is which. Uh... Like this has a particular house, a story, a thing behind it, right? So yeah. you you dug into all of that. That led you to, I assume, then translate this into the various uh, elements. And so, oh, it's somebody that asked in the comments: Is that Forge World or is that Titanic scale? No, this is the this is the Forge World. <laughs> this is this is full scale. Yes, I, I actually clarified before anybody yeah, because I remember this being before Adeptus Titanicus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to set a little marine in your picture next to it. That way, we all know it's the it's the Forge World one. You can tell yeah. though because the details aren't as crisp on the on the uh, Adeptus Titanicus version of this. Guy. Yeah, um, I tell you one thing: painting Adeptus Titanicus models they're fantastic, but. I hate painting the trim on them. <laughs> oh God, yeah, it's just because it takes it takes what's <laughs> always uh, a time-consuming task, right? In the in the trim, and just like whoop, really like shrinks it down. So now you're going to be yeah. utterly. But it's still there. There's still, there's still <laughs> tons of it, but it's yep. just really small. Yeah, uh, I find uh, this thing same thing with a lot of chaos figures where they have that sort of edging brocade around every piece of armor. It's like okay, tuck in. You're going to be working on this for the next, yeah. you know, month. All right, great. Yeah. Um, so these are the uh, Death's Heads, uh, Titan Legion. It's Legion Mortis, but you know, called Death's Heads. Um, and so I, I really ran with that. So if you look on the the carapace um, freehand at the top, it's actually got a Death's Head moth. Um, I was like, well, no one else has painted a death's head moth on on the death's heads why why haven't they done that because uh, it just seemed like an obvious thing um, but then i thought right i'm going to take it a step further and um turn the eyes on the wings into the eyes on the skull beneath it um it was a really complicated uh piece to work out that actually um and a few people said it looked a bit like dame edna everage <laughs> 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 I can uh, I can see it. I would have never made the association, yeah. but now that you've said it, yeah, I can um, see it. So those people are all blocked. But <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, like I, I just I found it kind of interesting, and I, I wanted it still look very grim, dark, and everything. Um, so like it's almost kind of like faded into the uh, the, the background color. Yep. Um, there's a lot of glazing going on here, uh, you know, just to make everything really soft and smooth. Um, and then, of course, there's the weathering on top of it as well. Yep. Yeah, uh, I like how you've chewed away a lot of the freehand, right? Like, there's there's many times where the, the freehand has been, the image has been chewed away, and you can see the carapace colors coming through yeah. underneath. Yeah. Um, it's, it's something that um, you have to be really careful doing, that you can't just go crazy applying 
chips on something um but you you can't also just put it in the places where you don't want it where you know you don't want to wait write off some like hard work right so you have to make it look realistic um but you know so carefully chosen areas of um chipping and things like that because if you only say like just chip the edgy bits or like the clean areas it's like well why are only those bits chipped um and actually it just looks it ends up looking a bit better if you so you might not want to but like say like the, the eyes or like the little skull or something just put a tiny little chip going over it um it, it just makes it more visually interesting yeah, I often think of this in uh, in layers is how I think of it. I don't mean layering in like the painting style. I mean layering and like it actually sets the narrative when you f when you can feel the different layers of the thing as it would exist in reality, right? Yeah, like exactly. the I, I always has struggle, the metal has the free hand and so on. I struggle explaining this to people so often. And it's like um, so the, the chipping would be in universe, and the free hand has been like painted onto the model. <laughs> in universe it's like, what do you mean it's painted in universe like, <laughs> yeah somebody did this right like some yeah, person yeah. rolled up next to this thing one day with a with probably a giant airbrush gun or whatever and yeah. spent hours actually creating this not. image with paint as opposed yeah, to say then, the enamel then, that's the armor carapace then they're like, but i thought you painted it i was like oh <laughs> <laughs> No, but, I, uh, I love it. Yeah, it's great touches too. All the little elements of the skull, like you have lots of cracked. The it it brings through even in not just doing a normal skull, you have all the sort of almost bubbling and cracking and stuff in the skulls. It adds that extra texture to the space. It did uh, through a few iterations. Um, at one point, I had like spikes coming off the cheekbones and things like that, but it started getting a bit too uh, busy. Um, you know, you have to sometimes pull back a little bit. Again, like we're talking about, you know clean space and things like that on the model um but yeah like i, I really enjoyed doing this um it was just it's so nice having the big uh, flat area to work on um and of course i'd cut off the those little arrows again <laughs> yep yeah <laughs> gotten rid of the arrows do you uh when you scrape it down and you have the line in the middle what do you what do you fill that space with and then sand down what's your what's your filler of your gap filler of that um, of i use milli cut. i like milli cut, uh super fine very good um, yeah. I assume you just fill it, scrape it, let it dry, sand it. Jobs yeah. are good. Yeah. Nice. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> All right. So speaking of of uh, of knights, let's go to. We'll come back to the shield in a minute, but let's go to the big boy here. So this is your your Zinch, uh themed knight, right? Yeah. Uh, so this this big guy, obviously, I think he, uh, you know, he entered in several different contests and did well absolutely gorgeous piece uh yeah just just take us through this thing we've got i've got several different photos because i'll kind of switch between them i'll look at the shield and stuff as as you talk I'll, I'll move around the photos right so um when i got this uh, again it was uh, i actually i bought this by accident actually so uh when i won my slayer sword um i was really depressed on the day because i didn't think i had got anything um, and so I was like, right, I need to do get something to cheer myself up. So I went and bought a knight, and I meant to get one of the different, one of the other ones. Um, and because they have like the, you know, their interesting naming conventions and things, it sounded a little bit like a different one. And I just stupidly just asked for the wrong one. I didn't even pay any attention until I got home. I was like, oh no, I've got this, this one. I don't even want this. Um, but I thought, no, I'm going to make it work. Um, because actually, when I then spent some time looking at the model, like I went online and looked at various versions of it, things like that, I actually really liked the silhouette. Um, so I was like, right, I'm going to I'm going to make this really interesting. Um, but the one thing that I didn't like on it was the shield that it comes with. Yeah, because he uh, comes with a big open shield normally, right? Yeah, and I was like, okay, I, I suppose for most people, a big flat shield is is no good. You know, it's it's kind of hard work to fill that in. Um, but I, I really like, you know, a, a big flat surface to paint on. So I was like, right, I'll just make my own. Um, it was a little bit risky uh, because, again, like I said, I, I don't spend a lot of time sculpting. Um, but I just drew around the shield on a piece of plastic card, cut it out, and then heated it up, bent it, and then took the original shield and clipped off all the corner bits. Yep. And, you know, sliced down and slotted them on. Of course, if I've messed that up, then I've just destroyed the, the shield. <laughs> um but it, it worked out really well. So um, I thought, well, that looks cool. 
but he, um, what I didn't do was uh, test fit it on the model. Okay. Um, you know, rookie mistake. <laughs> Sometimes it just it, it happens because you get going, you get excited, you're actually yeah. working on a thing, and you just it never clicks. Yeah, yeah. Like I built the, the rest of the model up for the pose and things, and I just assumed the shield would fit because I'd drawn around the other one. So I was like, well, it's the same size shield. It'll fit on fine. Right. Of course, the other shield is uh, um, concave. <laughs> and um, uh, so it actually goes away from the model on the edges. Right. Whereas this, you know, it curves right into it. So you can see here it's touching the uh, shoulder pad and the carapace. Um, but when I, so this was the day before the competition. I was gluing it all together. And I put the shield on, and it wouldn't fit. Um, it, it was actually jammed up against the uh, the um, the shoulder pad, and I was like, "Oh my god!" So the day before the competition, if you look on the um, the, the image where you see the knight with the the, um, the lance arm as well, it's got these small cylinders in the arm. Yeah. Those aren't actually on the original model. I just got like a, a really thick thick um, plastic tubing and cut it down and. So it's extended by about a centimeter, uh, both arms, just and that's purely so that I can get the shield to fit. <laughs> <laughs> just to push it out, so you had some extra space yeah. there, basically. Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, that was a bit stressful. Um, you know, I was like, I was heating the model up, trying to bend it in, and all sorts. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is great. And obviously, I love the Zinch work. So we can, I just want to drill on some of it here. Obviously, with Zinch, you've got a lot of different iconography you can work with, right? So we've, we've classically got the eye. Um, did, did the symbol, the eye of Zinch symbol, did you make that or did that come like in a kit or something? Like, where did the, the, the thing that's on the top center of his, above his head, the little, the actual sculpted piece. Oh, the, the sculpted piece. That's you know, that comes on the kit. The, uh, okay. the little chaos, um, which is just nice. You know, fitted in nice with the theme of the model. Yep. Um, I did. There's a, there's a, a bit of uh, other conversion work on it. So obviously for the shoulder pads, again, I cut off all those little arrows and things. Um, to give me some space. Yep. Well, um, these especially because they're already quite broken up on this version because it hey, he has yeah. a layered uh, version of it instead of just one long form. one. Yeah, no, it was a bit annoying then, actually. <laughs> but um, I also, oh, so I had another issue on this model. Um, on the chest plate, I was like, right, I'm going to join the chest together. So I can't use the original mounting uh, system that they've got for it. Uh, but I wanted to do it so it had the ribs painted on the chest. Um, so I had it all stuck together and I you know, painted all the freehand on and everything. I was really happy with it. I went to put it on the model. I was like, I've painted it upside down. Um, Oh, so yeah, you had thought, oh my god, I've run into the same thing. Okay, so the night, the under chest piece, when you did the, when you were doing the painting and you had it there, you thought it fit on, you know, X way, right? And then when you actually yeah. went to do the fit, you're like, oops, nope, actually it goes the other way. Because all the chests on the knights are like counterintuitive. Yes, in the exactly. shape <laughs> against how you think it would fit. Yeah. I've done the and exact same thing. And I was like, and the problem is the the shape is so different for the fitting. I'm um, like, I can't. It's not even close. I, how am I going to make this work? Like they're going to look at this from the back, <laughs> and they can see straight in there. And it's like it's it's not connected to anything. I like I need it to go in this position so it looks like ribs, and it's not even close. And so I just I got like a massive blob of green stuff, and some guitar wire, and I just stuck on guitar wire going all the way around it, and kind of made like this big chunk of mess <laughs> and glued that to it um but actually it didn't look too bad like i use a lot of guitar wire and it just looks like it's a load of you know cabling and things like that right. attaching uh, to it so i mean it works all, all right but that again was uh, a bit stressful <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can imagine. And, and yes, I've run into, oh my God, the exact same problem. It's so funny that you say that. Yes. That night the, or the, 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 the night under chest piece is one of the most annoying things because if you, you, it's so counterintuitive, like the way it looks versus the way it goes on. Yeah. I see it's even worse for someone like me. So like, I, I love knights and things, um, like, you, you kind of like, you just, you think, well, I know how this goes together anyway. I don't even have to look at the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need those. I'm yeah, fine. Yeah. I've, I've been doing this for a long time. I know how to put, like I built Titans. This is no problem. <laughs> it's like, what? 
Oh, it's great. So I do want to drill in on the shield a little bit on just kind of the artwork on it, because this is just such a great example of your uh, of your skill with Incredible Freehand. So I just want to ask basically some 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 questions here. Um, one, obviously the symbol of Zine, where did you come up with the, the modification of it into this? Like walk uh, us in the audience through kind of how you decided to incorporate the elements that you did here and how you came to them. Um, well, I looked at lots of reference for a start, you know, I went look back through all the old like realms of chaos and things. Uh -huh. Um, there was kind of like a, a similar sort of idea. Uh, that I saw that was like a very old uh, black and white sketch, really, really detailed. Uh, what is it, ink drawing? Um, really detailed. And I, I loved that. And I was like, um, it would be quite hard to paint that um, to work as freehand, but I can just, you know, change it and do my own thing while keeping the, the sort of general concept of it. So obviously the shape is very zinch, but like the zinch symbol, but um, the it kind of, it's like a fish. Right. Um, and like that was the, the kind of the the sort of basic idea of the the design that i saw and then i was just like right so i turn i make the big eye in the middle then like the, the whole design within the shape is is mine but it's still like you know it's very heavily um drawn from that concept wise um and really is i mean I, I know it looks fairly detailed but it's it's i was gonna say it's, it's fairly easy to do but that sounds awful um <laughs> Well, I want to drill in on this for a moment because you, you, one of the best, so you had shared this. I think you said in the post that your wife encouraged you to share this sort of stuff more. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember a post you did where you shared like kind of the stages of your free hand, right? Yeah. And where you started from just like, I think it was with Mortarian's wings, but you had, it was like started with these simple lines and then it's just like refine, 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 yeah. refine, yeah. right? I assume this went through the similar sort of process. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, like, I'm because I've been drawing and painting so long, um, it doesn't really take me that long to do something like this because it's a flat surface. So, like I was saying before about models that are really detailed and they have, like, all the sculpted detail on, that takes me a lot longer to do because it's just a pain because you've got, like, all like, three-dimensional surfaces, um, you know, you have to go through the edges and things like that. And, Whereas this, it's just flat. So I can, you know, I can just paint the fun stuff and not have to worry about how I, right. <laughs> any of the three dimensional aspects of it. Um, I mean, one thing, I, so the weathering on this, again, plays a big part on it. Yep. Um, because you have to fill the space. Uh, and so the weathering actually becomes part of the artwork um, while still working as weathering. Um, so like, so if you take all the weathering off, it actually looks quite empty. So there is um, like a little bit of detail in going around the edge, like some uh, vines and things with a little skull mixed in and stuff like that. Um, because like I worked out the, the zinch symbol and then I put the rose on, uh, and those were all fairly straightforward. Although I have to say roses are not easy to freehand. <laughs> no, they're really, really, really hard because they're such a complex shape. Like I, I too have painted many roses and this is like the gold standard of roses in my mind, <laughs> like what you've done here. Uh, and I've, I've come back to this photo that, you know, like of, of your roses many, many times as reference work in my own stuff, as well as just literally Googling pictures of roses. Like one of yeah. the things I always tell people is start from the real world, right? Like yeah. one of the best things you can do is just go out and look at yeah. the actual thing. I, I'm sure people get bored of listening to me say that, but I'm, they're like, uh, how would I do this? How would I do that? I just like, just get reference, get reference, real world reference. Don't look at 2D artwork for reference because whoever's done that has in, done their own version, their, their own interpretation. So they all have put things on there that aren't accurate, but they look cool for whatever reason. They're, you know, they're, There are reasons why they've done that. Um, but if you just copy that, you might not necessarily understand the reasons and if you're looking for references, it's probably because you don't understand the reasons anyway. So use real like photographic reference. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Anytime you can start from the real world, you're just on better footing, right? And oftentimes yeah. what I'll do, I know from my personal thing, is I'll actually get the picture, leave it up, and I'll have it up on my screen as I'm painting. So I can constantly be referencing that real world thing. Like I'll just leave a big picture of a rose up on my screen. Right. Yeah, so I'm, exactly. I'm constantly looking back and checking what I'm doing as I'm refining against the real thing that, that exists out there in nature. So whenever yeah. you can find it hard to find a reference picture for a giant undead fish. 
But well, yeah, <laughs> you can find right, like skull pictures, like obviously. Yeah, like, yeah, it's easy. But like, you get all sorts of, of, you know, references like you say for skulls and things like that. Yep. Um, I'm just you, you don't have to copy it. That's the thing. But you just have to understand it, or just have like be influenced by it. You know, say like oh, because you'll see things that you wouldn't have thought to include. Um, just little, like small little curves on a bone or something. Uh, I always see this on skulls as well. Like if you go and draw a skull, you could probably draw a skull pretty accurately. But then if you go and get a photograph and then compare it, you'll see like just like on the eye sockets, there'll be like a little tiny nick on the eyebrow or whatever right. that you haven't um, incorporated that actually makes a it makes it look much more realistic um, and authentic. Yep, absolutely. Well, these kind of shapes have so much little interesting detail that it just helps to look at. And I agree, the weathering is doing uh, a lot of great work here. And again, it's creating those layers, right? Yeah. So you have the layer of the blue, and then you have the the image that somebody in the world painted on top of that blue. But then yeah. you have places where it's chipped away, where you can see that, and then where we've gone all the way down to the metal. And I think mm -hmm. I, one of my favorite things is streaking over freehand. I just... I love like weather rust streaking over freehand yeah. because it just makes the freehand thing feel so much more a part of the thing it's painted on. Right. Yeah. I really enjoy doing that. I mean, people always say, how can you do that? You know, you're going to ruin your freehand or whatever, but it's like, no, it's part of the freehand. Right. Um, and also the question I get asked a lot is what, um, what materials have I used to do the streaking? Like, I'm like, it's just paint. You know, it's, everything that I do is just water and paint. I don't really use any, um, you know, special techniques. It's, it's not like I've used oil paint with gloss varnish and streaked it out or anything like that. It's purely just acrylic paint and water. Awesome. No, this is this is such a such a great great piece, and I just love all the the little additions and details to it. Um, something I want to draw everybody's attention to just in case they missed it. I don't know if they might have, but I love on the face mask, which again has this big, large flat that you incorporated like the bird mask mouth, right? Like the, the, the skull just makes him seem so much more angry and intimidating. Like there's a huge, that feels chaosy to me. Uh, when I see that, that little, yeah. that little image. That, I had to again, cut off all the trim on it. <laughs> that comes with trim all the way around it. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh so uh folks uh, we're gonna do some questions at the end so if you've got questions drop them in the chat and then we'll get through that but before we get to questions we got to get to one last piece of course and that is uh big papa m himself mortarian uh obviously i mean this is just a a seminal work uh, I would hope you were at least happy with this one, although I understand the happy, not satisfied. <laughs> I, I do think this is just a, a, a gorgeous piece of work. One of the things I particularly love about it, beyond everything that is obvious, <laughs> right? which is, uh, there's a lot to love here, but I, I love your tonal choice of his armor, putting him in more of the uh, heresy era feeling kind of color yeah, to it. Yeah which I think just makes him so much brighter against all the darker tones that you've used around it. The deeper flesh color of the wings, the deeper wood or whatever it is, you know, the deeper material of like his gun, his scythe and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so I love that choice. I also really think you used the weathering so well here to tell stories in the shadows so that nothing ends up being visually boring. When I look at stuff like the, the I don't know what it is, like his little poison gas breather thing or whatever it is on his back, the way that the oxidation is worked into the, the shadows there to make the deeper colors have the counterbalancing visual interest against the highlights, right? So that your eyes aren't just stuck at the high points. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a kind of similar thing to the, uh, the Nighthorn guy as well uh, with the glowing on the ribs. Yep. So, so take us through some, some, I'll, I'll go to the big image here so we can see him out. Go, give us, give us some, some talk about this guy. Right. Um, so there was a lot of love hate <laughs> with this guy. Um, he is very hard to paint. Uh, he's, I, I say, but very, very, very hard to paint. Um, so I was talking earlier about like, I like to stick the models together. Right. Um, you know, before I paint them, um, this guy I couldn't like. He was just completely left in separate sections, um, which 
and then so a i spent a lot of time repainting areas because i've rubbed paint off keep picking them up and test fitting constantly test fitting and things um and even then at the very end when i put the model together the uh the wings were facing kind of down i was like this is awful you, you, so i spent all this time on the wings and you can't really see them uh you know the freehand on them that clearly when you look directly at it uh, so I had to build the base so it's actually tilted backwards. Uh, gotcha. I actually prefer it. Yeah, I actually prefer it like this so you can see him directly face on. If you look at the original picture, he faces downwards. Yeah, he's like, more hunched forward. Yeah, yeah he's, he's hunched over. So you actually miss a lot of the you know the nice detail on him. Um, the I mean the easiest part of this model actually was the freehand wings. Like that was the idea that I had. Um, when I saw the model, I was like, right, I uh, I want to make him unique. Um, although there's quite a lot of Motarians now with eyes on their wings. <laughs> <laughs> you started a popular trend here. Sir. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I was like, I just want to, you know, I want to make sure that he's like my own piece and not just like a generic kind of looking chaos guy. Um, and the, the concept with the, the eyes and the wings is so one eye is like a human eye and the other one's a demonic eye. You can't really see it that clearly in this picture, but the other eye, it's got like three um, pupils on it. So it's like the symbol of Nurgle built into the eye. Right. Um, and then it's got like all the fleshy stuff going around and things like that. But like the, the general freehand itself was actually the, like, the easiest part on the model for me to paint. Um, but so originally I was painting this as a golden demon piece, but then um, I ended up going to the Crystal Brush to enter it, but I was out of time to enter it for the Crystal Brush. And so I ended up having to rush it like mad to get certain parts on this finished. And the finish on it in the lower section on the cloak um, and, you know, just a few other pieces was rough in comparison to the rest of it. Um, so I was... Um, I wasn't happy at the time and other things like I, I just hadn't had time to just reflect on what I wanted to do like the wings on the little like Nurgle cherubs floating around him uh, originally I was like I wasn't sure what to do on those and I just like I just copied the box art um, and actually when I looked at it I didn't like those at all because because they were so light they were they were like kind of focal points and they drew right, right. Um, so after the crystal brush I just ripped those little wings off and um, so I had to do exactly the same process as I did on the big wing. So, you know, cut off all the um, the details on there. Uh, yeah, sanded you, right, I was going to say, because you did shave off all of the, because it normally has yeah. all this veining and structure to it, right? Which I yeah. assume it's actually, it's actually quite hard work on these wings because they're not flat. They've got like all curves and things all over them, uh, as well as all the details. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful when you start cutting off surfaces because you might end up with like a hard flat surface but it has to look organic so yeah um, i ended up using a lot of um like uh, extra thin like tamiya glue and just coating that over it a lot and then sanding it again so it kind of like softened the surface right um yeah and so i just did the same exact same thing to the little wings and then did those as replicas of the big wings um and so um, having those darker then didn't take away from the main body. So again, you then focus on like the shoulder and the face and things. They become like the focal point of the model again. Um, but yeah, and then so like after the crystal brush and I went back to it and like I spent time, you know, adding, you know, softening all the, the finish on the cloak and, you know, working in. So it's got like this green flame effect at the bottom. Right. Um, that, that was quite tricky to work out because it blends in with the cloak. It, there's no separation really between the flames and the cloak itself. And so you have to kind of figure out how you're going to do that because you can't really put a hard line because it would look too obvious. Like it would be quite jarring. Right. Um, so you have to get like a transition going on. But do you do like a soft transition or a quick transition? Uh, and I ended up doing like these small little dots and so kind of like spores, I imagine, um, from the like, noxious flame type effect uh, and then the if you actually look on the cloak all over there's these, these little um yellow dots and things put all over it to kind of like represent like the the flames being part of the cloak yeah almost like the pollen of, of a sort right of this of this yeah, flamey exactly, disease yeah. spreading around like there's a physical mass to the flame this is one of those things that they've started sculpting on miniatures that i'm not sure i really truly love often when the minute when they sculpt air <laughs> you know, like yeah. smoke and, and mist and stuff. I'm just I was yeah. like, ugh. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, flames aren't too bad because you can work with those a little bit for you know doing some OSL or whatever. But you know all the smoke and everything, um, I'm not a big fan of. And actually, I left uh, some off of this model. Um, so he had it comes on his side as well. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Green smoke coming off that, and also on his um, breather jetpack thingy at the top, there's the option to have a lot more smoke on there, and that connects all of his the the tubes coming out of his back there'd be like all smoke coming out of those and i was like right i'll just I'll leave all that off <laughs> like this guy's a chimney man he's just belching smoke yeah. out there yeah, yeah. i was like uh, I, I don't think it needs all that you get the impression with the you know the, the bits on it already right no he's he's truly gorgeous and yes to, for those some people who said it in the comments and i completely agree it's even more gorgeous in person not that this picture isn't a great picture it certainly is but like seeing this in person, both originally at Crystal Brush and then over at Warhammer Fest, it really is a, a seminal work. So I, I do think you should be proud of this to, 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 to the center of your being, my friend. This is, this is absolutely I mean, wonderful. He's, uh, he's on display at um, Warhammer World at the minute if you want to go and see him. Uh, yeah. Obviously, if you're in the UK, probably it's easiest. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's 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 worth making for for all of those uh, out there. It is worth making a sabbatical uh, over there at least at least once in your life if you're in another place, just because there's so much to see there. This amongst uh, uh, so much like the museum there and all the pieces, and being able to look at the history. It yeah, is it is it is fantastic to visit. Um, you know, just for the sake of they've got like uh, old historical pieces and things like that, old Magnet Bay things. Really nice to visit. Yep, completely agreed. All right, sir. Well, let's uh let's go ahead and minimize that out. We'll bring you back on screen there. Okay, so you ready for some questions? Uh, I'll try my best. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with my questions. These are rapid fire. Here we go. Uh, these are all these are all the tough questions. You ready? We're gonna hit you with the hard ones. <laughs> okay. All right. First question. You can only pick one. Only one. Who is your favorite miniature artist besides yourself? Past or present? Um, I'll say probably Sergio Calvo. Okay. Totally fair answer. Great, great painter. For those who don't know Sergio, I mean, obviously he's uh, a great painter who's done a lot I of plays at Crystal Brush many times. Kind of like light, how he uses light and things on his models. Really good. Yep. Very, uh, totally support that answer. Uh, as as somebody, you've been other people's answers, so that's that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to pick a single color of paint as your favorite, what would be your single color? Um, at the moment, I like my fist in red. Okay, all right, good answer. Uh, and finally, uh, what is your and you can construe the word type however you want. What is your favorite type? of minis to paint and type can mean anything you like here yeah oh, i i don't i don't know um <laughs> i mean obviously you see that i paint like big robots and things but um i don't necessarily enjoy that any more than anything else like i enjoy doing like small models as well and things um i, I don't I don't really have a, a favorite as such. Anything that's like, you know, got clean lines on. <laughs> there you go. No, I think that's a very good answer because there's a lot of minis in the world that you look at and you go, oh, that's cool. And then you look at it up close and you're like, oh, this wouldn't actually be pleasurable to, to paint. Yeah. It's not clean. The sculpt is, is messy. It's dirty. There's too much. Like the sculptor didn't sculpt it with, the, with a painter's eye, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of conflicting shapes and things like that that don't work well together that won't suit that. So, yeah, I get that. Totally fair answer. All right, let's do some viewer questions here. Uh, we've got a couple that have been uh, that have been asked throughout. Uh, all right, so uh, Theodore had asked, "Do you uh, do you varnish your pieces for competition? Like, what do you do for varnishing?" Uh, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, I quite like a AK Interactive Ultramat varnish mm -hmm. um, purely because it it is ultramat. Uh, it's the best mat that I've found um, purely because like sometimes I don't want that, you know, that satin or gloss finish on a, on a model. Uh, and especially for photographs, actually uh, a matte finish is much nicer to work with. Right. You don't get any interference from anything else. It just, yeah, it's... exactly. You, you, you just get the, the, the lighting from the light, but you don't get the reflection. Right. Yep. Okay. 
Uh, agreed. I'm, I'm a big fan of AK Interactive Ultra Matt as well. It just, it does the work, right? Like, it does what it says on the tin, 100%, which I appreciate. Uh, all right. Oh. We lost Richard. <laughs> Come quite here. There you go. Okay, you're back. We lost you for like a second, but you're back now. All right. Uh, can you hear me okay? Am I coming through? Yeah, right? yeah. You just, you just come back in. <laughs> yeah, no issue. Okay. Uh, uh, any, uh, any paints or brands that you particularly, you know, utilize or or enjoy more than anything else? Um, my preferences for paint are, um, Vallejo Model Color and Games Workshop. Um. Part of me likes Games Workshop just because everyone says, oh, they're, you know, they're bad paints. <laughs> Again, just to be contrary, I'm like, all right, I'll use Games Workshop paints. But I do actually like them. Um, I, I actually like to glaze with Games Workshop paints. Everyone's like, oh, Games Workshop paints are rubbish for glazing. And I'm like, but they're my favorite for glazing. <laughs> nice. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Sorry, just cycling through all the questions here. Uh, <laughs> somebody said, how many hours did it take you to freehand just the skulls on the knight's shield? The, all the little baby oh, skulls. Yeah, the, the, the little baby skulls. Yes. Oh, not that long, actually. They're very, um, I mean, if you zoom right into them, they're very, uh, kind of simple skulls. It's just kind of like two eyes, uh, nose and some little teeth and things. Um, yeah, it's actually it, because you don't have to blend a lot on them. You know, you just paint in the shape, and then uh, I kind of just uh, glazed over the whole thing for, for getting this shadow shape. Yeah, you know, so there's like a slight curve to give you know like a three dimensional look to the body of the the fish. You know, that's a separate shading. Like right? the individual skulls, there's not that much uh, effort gone into them. Yep. Uh, somebody in the chat asked for you to talk a little bit about the new Chaos Warrior you did. You painted up one of the new Chaos Warriors from the, uh, the Slaves oh, right. of Darkness yeah. release. Yes. Yeah, um, I painted that really quickly. Um, I, because again, I've got the, the whole set. Uh, um, they are gorgeous. Got, I just finished up I, a group myself. They're absolutely I, I saw it, I saw it, um, and I was very jealous that you've got so much painted. <laughs> 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 um, yeah um i don't know what can i say about that like it, uh, it was very very simple painting um it works really strongly uh with uh high contrast um so there's a lot strong light direction from the top left um you know with strong lights on it and then there's a lot of shadow and then i just you know very quickly glazed it all um yeah it's it's a fairly simple model so when you're let's let's break this down for just a little bit, everybody, because I, I think back when you did uh what was his name? Mr. Special Character Ultramarine guy guy that they re-released as a primaris. I can't Oh um, was it Marnius Kanga? There it is, yes, thank you. Uh him, you talked about how he was a rougher piece because you had done him kind of quickly and stuff like that. I mean, he was absolutely gorgeous, but he was you said mentioned he was rougher, you mentioned the Chaos Warrior. So this is kind of like your version of when you quote unquote speed paint is what I take those yeah. to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. So are you roughing that in like your general method? Do you, are you going in and using, you know, something like thicker paints, roughing, wet blending that out, sketching it out? Like how are you working that when you want to work fast like that? Um, it's very, uh, very sketchy. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of like, uh, so I'm doing layers as well, but the, the nice thing about the sketching style is so you, you you know you very quickly block in like the light points and things like that mm -hmm. um, but I, I still i kind of like use still use the colors so um you know for sketching uh, sometimes people just use like a, a gray scale and then work over the top of that but i'm just using the actual colors uh, that you'd normally use on well not always like I, the the actual armor colors that i use were a little bit weird i think i can't remember exactly what they were but i know that um, people were like, oh, that's a bit of a weird choice. But as you know, <laughs> it turned sort of blue in the end anyway. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm just moving the brush very fast, right? You know, to get like lots of marks down, and like so you can layer over, keep building up marks and things. And it doesn't take very long to do that, um, as long as you're you know where you're putting the brush. Um, I think sometimes people think for speed painting you just kind of slop the paint on, but you still um precise in where you put it it's just that you don't have to be um quite as neat 
uh, so like you, you covered the whole model very quickly, getting all the base colors down and the light points and things. And then you can spend as much time as you want really afterwards, just glazing over the top, um, doing things like that. Yeah. So, so you, you get those, those, you get the light control in first, set the mood yeah. of the piece. And then from there, it's the refine, 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 right? That's kind of your yeah. strategy. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so for that piece, I hadn't spent that much time refining it. Um, but because, I mean, minus color is quite a big space, like it's a primary screen, it's quite big. Um, so it just makes it that little bit easier. The smaller the model, the harder it is to do something like that, because right. uh, like an expressive mark on a tiny model is huge. Whereas an expressive mark on a big model, uh, it just, it's, you know, it's much more subtle. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the reasons I love painting like 54 and 75 mil stuff is you can work in that way really easy because you can yeah. you have a lot more space to be free like that. Yep. In some ways, so like, there's a, I get like a bit of a pet peeve where so you see models online and the the seventy five or ninety millimeter whatever model is exactly the same size in the photograph as a twenty five thirty eight thirty two millimeter model, um, and so you, like they're compared as if they're the same size right. uh, of the painting on them, and it's such not a fair comparison. Right, 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 absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the amount of uh, the the difficulty curve is very different. I also find like fifty four is I what I found to be just like the sweet spot where yeah. you have this perfect mix between space to work and do what you want, but also like yeah, I don't know. There's just something really comfortable about that scale. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's not so big that it's going to take you forever to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, John wanted to know how do you come up with your color schemes. Uh, I just use the colors I like. Easy <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> Do you have a reference color wheels or stuff like that? Or is all that just innate in your brain at this point after years and years of art training? Um, if I ever get stuck, I'm, I mean, like a color wheel, it's, it's just like, you know, opposite colors. It doesn't, you're not going to really learn that much from it. Um, yeah, I, I pretty much, so I know the color wheel, so yeah, I don't really reference it. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, from, uh, Rob at the miniatures paint, miniatures paintbrush. He says, uh, he really likes the eyes you do and you tend to incorporate, you know, a lot of eyes, especially in the pieces we saw here. Um, any advice for creating, you know, compelling reflections on eyes? Um, look at reference again for eyes. Um, you'll see, so everyone does white dots because that's how you do really small eyes. You know, everyone sees the games workshop eyes and things like that. And you can't really, do a lot with you know a tiny like one millimeter eye um but obviously as they get bigger you can then incorporate that and like you know different uh, interesting reflections and um if you actually look at the reflections you'll see uh, they they are actually reflections of physical objects around you and things like that quite often the sky or you know spotlights and things um but the shapes are interesting so don't just do a white dot and, and also don't just purely go for a white dot, you know, um, do like an off-white. And then you can actually highlight the reflections as well. Um, it makes the actual reflection dot look brighter than rather painting everything white, which can then look a bit flat. Nice, nice. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, best tip for uh, somebody, for a beginner with uh, skin and achieving more blending and, and smooth colors on skin? Hmm. Best, best tip. Um, for smooth, uh, use thin paints, I would say, <laughs> for skin to get, like, you need that smooth finish. The thing with skin is um, it's not opaque. Uh, it has a translucency to it. So um, multiple layers uh, of thin paint and adding, you know, you can add in a bit of color and things and then glaze over you know, to soften those colors. You can even put like small veins in and things like that. And then, you know, as you glaze over it, they become like they're underneath the layers of skin. So, you, you know, try and work with that kind of the translucency of the skin it makes it look a, a lot more interesting, I think. Nice. Uh, what would you give, uh, what's your simple advice for people uh, who want to start out with freehand? They, they, they're they not trying to get to where you know, like Mortarian's wings or something, but they'd like to incorporate some simple freehand elements. What's your What's your best advice there? Mm. Um, use a decal. <laughs> 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 um, 
Well, no, seriously though, if you going in for competition, like um, the, the the level of uh, freehand has to be so high that you're actually better off using a decal because you'll get marked down for poor freehand, whereas you won't for using a decal. But it, to to improve, to you know, get back to the question. Um, I would say practice is really important. Practice drawing. Uh, your brush control is really, really important. So just a case of practice. Learn how the paint works and things. Um, you need, like, say you, you want smoother finish, you use thinner paint. Sometimes you want a really hard mark on something. Uh, and in that case, you need thicker paint, but you don't want it so thick that you leave a three-dimensional mark. Um, obviously, you know, different brands have different properties. And so you just have to learn your paints. It's, it's, it's a lot of learning. <laughs> Nice. Also, yeah, keep it simple as well. Don't go for something too complicated to start with. Uh, and also, freehand is a lot easier on a black background because then you can use the black as a rubber. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. This is what I tell people all the time. Like, one big part of freehand is having it on a neutralish background color so you've got an eraser, right? Because then if you go outside the lines, you can always just do, 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 do. You yeah. can push back if, in into if the you've freehand. Put, if you put a transition on the background, like and a very obvious transition, you're going to be in for a world of pain if you make a big mistake because you can't fix that. <laughs> yeah. um like it's even worse if you've done an airbrush background because you can't then hand paint the replicate the, the airbrush finish um so yeah don't do that well, i mean like you can but you know just be, be careful prepared. yes yeah. <laughs> the area where you're going to place the free end try to have that be a relatively consistent and smooth color maybe you've got some hard like take that carapace for example that you had on the on the warhound right like you could have deeper shadows on the side of it but the top color there make that kind of consistent right so there was you're not doing a lot of deep free end over there on the side so cool let use that area or the corners for a little bit of highlight tonal transition stuff like that but then keep the the area where you're going to put that nice and solid yeah yep i agree all right. Well, that brings us to the end of our questions. So I'll say, Richard, thank you for spending so much time with us this morning. This has been absolutely fantastic, sir. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Look forward to seeing you in a couple months. Uh, not long now. Coming up too quickly, as a matter of fact, I think. So uh, shockingly <laughs> fast. <too> quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, Richard is also teaching at Adepticon. Uh, I, I assume your classes are are uh, are either full or sold out or whatever but i would still yeah, say put yourself on the wait list uh it's it, you never know like you, if you ever if get you turn up on the day they so there's sometimes are able to squeeze some extra people in so if you're there <laughs> exactly and we seat people yeah. from the wait list first like that's what yeah. we're instructed to do so my strong advice is i've never taught a class where well i have taught some classes where it doesn't happen but let me say it this way often one person or two people will not show up because it's a big convention. People think they're yeah. going to go and then, oh, turns out I got into a game or I met my friends or they wanted to go to lunch or whatever. So put yourself on the wait list. If you can take a class with this man or sub to his Patreon, you are doing yourself an immense favor. Richard is an artist of singular talent and uh, you would do well to, to learn all you can from him. So thank you very much, Richard, for your time. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, as always, we'll see you next time. Thank you.